Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. With Guild Wars 2 End of Dragons on the horizon, I thought it would be an interesting video to look back at some of the old systems and cut content from Guild Wars 2 over the years. I have a couple other videos similar to this subject, but they're more short formed. So this one's going to be me going through a bunch of the features, cut content, scrap content, unfinished content, and talking about it. Let's start with core Guild Wars 2, then we'll kind of transition to season one, Heart of Thorns, and then we'll talk about some Pathfire stuff. But as for some cut content from core Guild Wars 2, first and foremost, we have the energy system. Now, I think many of us are familiar with the old energy system of Guild Wars 1. And of course, the alpha of Guild Wars 2 had a similar energy system where every attack required energy, consumed energy, and also dodge rolling consumed lots of energy. This also allowed you to dodge more than twice in his immediate succession. And of course we have Daredevil, which gave you a third dodge, but in the old system of energy, you could probably dodge five, six, seven, ten times, so long as you had energy to use. Of course, we saw this energy-esque system adapt and change and was eventually inputted on the Revenant, where many of your skills cost energy. Next for Guild Wars 2, core Guild Wars 2, we have class trainers. Now, class trainers are a standard in MMORPGs, but I'd say particularly RPGs. I felt like MMOs, they have been starting to get rid of class trainers. So you are losing a little bit of that role play, lore friendly aspect of being taught how to do your class or how to perform your profession. But in core Guild Wars 2, they actually did have class trainers where you would go and purchase your traits. Class trainers were used to purchase adept, master, grandmaster traits, and that's how you would acquire those to really flesh out your profession and flesh out the way you played. Now, I must admit, I am kind of a fan of class trainers, and especially for the elite specialization system with Guild Wars 2, I think that would be the perfect opportunity to reintroduce class trainers to then teach players that specific style of their class for that particular expansion. Or, you know, even reintroducing class trainers to be a system for new players to go and talk to these class trainers and then they set up a quest or they set up a little arena for you to try out a certain skill. I think class trainers could come back and I would really like to see what it would be like in 2022. Similar to the old class trainers, we have the old trait system. Now the trait system went through multiple iterations. I think the alpha system is some of the earliest images we got of the trait system where you had two of your profession trait lines and then you had specific trait lines for your weapons. So say for an elementalist, you had a trait line for your scepter and your focus or your staff or your daggers. It was very much different and very specific to your certain weapons that you're using in addition with two profession specific. When Guild Wars 2 launched, they reevaluated the trait system and then created what we know today as the six tier traits with each line being specific to the profession and also incorporating those weapon trait perks. And then of course, when we had Heart of Thorns roll around, we had this specialization revamps where instead of just having a roster of six that you would spend 30 points in each and you could kind of go through each of the lines, we had to actually commit to three specific specializations that we wanted to use. And while it did kind of restrain some more niche creative builds, it did allow us to have three full trait lines instead of in the old system when we could only really go down two full trait lines and have a third one be half complete. So it in a way did incorporate more power into the professions, but it did kind of strip away some of that flexibility and that creativity. And then as for cut content of the story of Guild Wars 2, I mentioned this in another video, but the fall of Zaitan and the possible other phases to Zaitan. Many of us have experienced the end of the personal story, and I think it is a general consensus within the community that Zaitan's boss fight is one that is not so great. It's one of the least engaging, least imaginative, and for a final boss fight, it truly falls flat. 
So I can't help but wonder what other phases were planned for Zaitan. And even beyond this, there's a point of interest on Zaitan's tower that you can't really get to unless you jump or break out of the map. And it's not a part of map completion, but it's still there. And even after this, there was this scrapped fourth lane of Zaitan's Rest. Zaitan's Rest is an area where the corpse of Zaitan would have been playable, would have been accessible to, to players to go and see it. And even in one of the earliest trailers, we have the Zaitan corpse model shown in the first trailer with a portal in its mouth, maybe hinting at the possibility of another dungeon or maybe, you know, in 2022, a raid or some type of situation where we put a, put a better cap on the story of Zaitan. Next, we have the entirety of season one. Season one was a game mode where they implemented updates live, they changed the world live. There were a bunch of different boss fights that are no longer in the game, but did once happen. And now we are kind of just waiting for season one to be reintroduced into the game, if it ever does. It started to be reintroduced in Icebrood Saga through the Scrying Pool. So we have a couple instances going over the backstory of the key characters in Dragon's Watch. However, we don't have the entire scope of season one, and that would be quite the production to go back, redo season one, implement these systems. However, I would be really happy to see the Battle of Lions Arch return because, believe it or not, that was the one event that got me back into Guild Wars 2. And ever since I returned to Guild Wars 2 for Battle of Lions Arch, I have not stopped playing. So I have fond memories of that event. Next, let's talk about Heart of Thorns. Heart of Thorns was the expansion of all expansions for Guild Wars 2. They bit off so much, and I don't know if they really could have chewed it all to its perfection. However, they did try, and with Heart of Thorns, there were many masteries early on that never really made it into the live game. From Gliding to the New Hawk to the Itzel to the Exalted, there were many different variations of masteries that they were playing with in the very beginning. But for Gliding, there were things like long jumps where you would jump off the ground higher when you were gliding, or you had strengthened bindings where your glider wouldn't rip apart as quickly. Leyline Gliding, even with mushrooms, we have mushrooms that would heal you, or being taught by the Itzel to use their harpoons to bring down Wyvern, which is really interesting because we've never seen Itzel Harpoons. So there were a lot of different aspects that maybe hinted at gameplay situations or even hinted at lore situations that we didn't get to see. Continuing on with Heart of Thorns, we have Orc Basin's original design. We saw what Orc Basin was originally supposed to look like in the launch trailer, where we have an actual city Tarir looked more city-like than it does now, maybe even a capital city that could have been used in an expansion zone, but there were a bunch of different houses or structures and settlements that looked like endless possibilities of lore and even story matters. Talking about story, we have Malik. Malik was a character in Guild Wars 2, and he's a Silvari that was not born of the Pale Tree. And developers have confirmed that Malik's storyline was considered for the development of Heart of Thorns. However, with the scope of the story that they wanted to tell, they couldn't give it justice within the larger scope of the entire Heart of Thorns expansion. So Malik's storyline has been put on hold, but maybe we'll see it another time. Talking a little bit about Dragon Stand, we have the fourth lane of Dragon Stand. Now this is the coastal area, the deserted coast, and the thorn thicket hollow area, where it's theorized that this fourth lane would have been storylines connecting to the Nightmare Court, or just another path to go down for Dragon Stand. It looks to be like a last minute change to Heart of Thorns. Lastly, for the Dragon Stand meta event, we have a possible cut phase of the Mouth of Mordormoth boss fight, where we would have perhaps gone up the Heart of Thorns Tower to finish off the Mouth of Mordormoth before he then headbutts a giant spike and decides to, you know, rip and give us a chest. But I was really interested in the possibility of what that would have felt like for everyone to then converge onto the same platform to finish off the mouth of Mordremoth. Now let's talk about Path of Fire. With Path of Fire, there was moments where I actually struggled with what they cut because Path of Fire was more tame in its scope and a little bit more linear and felt like it had a better grasp. But then giving it some thought and doing a little bit more diving, I actually found a decent amount of cut content from Path of Fire. 
So for Path of Fire, first and foremost, in a story step, the Hall of Heroes was a scrapped area for the story. It's said that after the Hollow Ground personal story event and personal story chapter, you would then go to the Hall of Heroes to talk to NPCs. But the explanation is that there just wasn't gameplay built around it, so they ended up scrapping it. However, the map is still in the files, I believe, and it was data mined, and it looks interesting. It's just the minimap art. We don't actually have many screenshots of the actual area. Anybody enjoy the concept of open world PvP? Now, I couldn't find where I heard this from or why it's in my brain. However, take my word for it. I believe that a developer once said that the Vitendi Arena was a testing ground for open world PvP where people would select a team and then fight in the arena, maybe in a small event. Now, it makes sense. There are three distinct color teams that, you know, ideally players would attribute themselves to. And then when the event starts, they go in the arena and fight it out. So it has been tamed back a little bit, which is sad. But I must say, the Vitendi Arena area is just stunning, and it would work really well as a PvP map. So if ArenaNet is listening, and anyone on the PvP team is listening with art and map stuff, I think this Vitendi Arena would be a perfect repurposing to an actual PvP arena map, where we have a game mode where it's, which is like a 3v3v3, where, you know, three teams fight it out. I think that'd be pretty interesting. Next up is the Crystal Oasis and Desert Highlands early map philosophy and design. Once again, I think I heard that the Crystal Oasis map and the Desert Highlands map were supposed to be one map, which would have been incredibly large. But of course, through development, they realized that the Desert Highlands and the Crystal Oasis, that one map would have been too large. So they split it up in the two existing maps that we have now. Talking a little bit more about story and partially the Desert Highlands, there were a bunch of deleted cutscenes for Path of Fire story, which have been data mined since then. But these images are mostly just cinematic cutscenes to introduce Vlast and Balthazar in the Herald of Balthazar, and then a final cutscene which shows Balthazar with Orin in its giant beastly contraption going and pushing through the domain of Vabi, but we never saw these. And honestly, especially for that last cutscene of showing Orin in the War Beast, I think that would have been perfect because in all honesty, I didn't even realize Orin was in that War Beast until Orin popped out of the War Beast when we fought the War Beast. <laughs> so it definitely caught me off guard. And I think it would have been a better situation where we actually had a cutscene to increase the cinematography, increase the cinematic feel, and also be better at, you know, telling the story of Orin being trapped in this thing. All right, everyone, that is a little snippet of a bunch of cut content, scrap content, unfinished content, and content that might have been in the game and then was gotten rid of over the years. In honor of End of Dragons releasing soon, I hope that you enjoyed this little retrospective look back into Guild Wars 2's development cycles, and I am a lover of cut content and the, the ideas of what could be, so this is a video just in praise and in honor of all the work that goes on to make Guild Wars 2 the game that it is today. Thank you all for coming. Like the video if it. If you'd like to support the channel and get videos early, such as this one, you can head over to the Patreon. Truly appreciate your support, patrons. But if you'd like to subscribe, comment, and share, that is also very much appreciated. If you would like to pre-order End of Dragons, the third expansion for Guild Wars 2, I also have links down below. And with all this said, I wish you farewell. See you all in the next video. Bye everyone! Mwah.